it seems basic, right? We all know what a fact is. Fact. Vaccines don't cause autism. Fact. Human-caused climate change is wreaking havoc on the Earth. Fact. The Earth is a sphere that orbits the sun. Facts are things we're sure about. But what do you think? What do you do when you seem to have a difference in facts, like in the above video? Perhaps you might think that there is a difference in knowledge, a difference in data. You and the other person might be educated differently. But I actually don't think that's the case at all, at least in today's climate. I think it's not a difference in facts, but a difference in what a fact is. What I think is the case is that we're not on the same page as to what differentiates truth and mistruth. And this leads to a bigger and even more fundamental problem. How do we as individuals, as a society, know how to act when we can't, can't even agree on a basis of facts or even on a basis of what a fact should be? So let's start with a pretty basic question. What is a fact? Well, a fact can only be defined one way, and that's through the scientific method. So the scientific method is one of the most powerful and, and important ideas ever conceived by man. It allows us to understand nature, to solve problems, or even to invent, but it has very specific steps. It starts with an observation. We see something about the world, and it intrigues us. We want to know more. We ask the important questions, like why or how. Then we develop a hypothesis. We take our best guess. We apply our existing understanding of the world and formulate what we think the answer to our interesting question is. Then we formulate a testable prediction. If my hypothesis is correct, then this other observation should be able to be made. We obviously know in one situation that our hypothesis fits. That's why it's our hypothesis in the first place. But we seek to change the conditions, question our assumptions, so that we can determine what the truth is. Then we conduct the experiment, which either accepts or rejects our hypothesis. Then, most importantly, we iterate. This is perhaps the most, most crucial part. By iterating, we're able to advance our understanding. We take it further. We ask deeper questions. We ask different tests. Now, most importantly, we seek to push things, our hypothesis, our assumptions, our understandings, until we break them. Only then do we discover. Only then do we learn. Now, none of this is new to you. Every middle schooler in the country is taught the above. But even if you were taught the above, your teachers probably didn't take the time to teach you the long-range consequences, the long-term effects of this way of thinking. At least, that's what current events seem to show. And there are two, in my opinion, misconceptions about the scientific method that I want to talk about today. And the first one is certainty. The first thing it's important to understand about the scientific method is that nothing is certain. We keep on iterating on our hypotheses, coming up with new tests until they break. The only time we can be certain is when the hypothesis is disproven. Until then, the hypothesis is not proven, but simply not yet disproven. And a theory is just a system of ideas that we think explains something. It's kind of our best guess. It's a hypothesis that we think is probably right, that we have confidence in. Scientists can say they believe in something with more or less certainty. They can say they're more, more or less confident. But if you ask a scientist if they're sure, if you ask a scientist if they're certain, they'll say no. Because if they're following the scientific method, they never will be. Fact. The Earth orbits the sun. I think this is something that hopefully we can all agree on. So this is called the heliocentric theory. No more emphasis on the word theory. Saying that the mo correct model of the solar system is that all the planets orbit the sun. But we didn't always used to think this way. We used to believe in geocentrism, which is that everything orbits the Earth. Now, we made an observation, we looked up at the sky, and that was the thing that made the most sense, right? Why should we assume that we're floating around some ball in the sky? We aren't, we aren't moving, right? Now, we may collect data and get more evidence, 
um, to this theory. And in fact, when we had kind of conflicting evidence, we just modified the geocentric theory to make it still work. Now, this all changed when Nicholas Copernicus uh, published on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, where he presented an alternate theory, the theory of gravitation and of heliocentrism. It was a mathematical model, really, not even observations, that was more simple and elegant and altogether more sensical. But we didn't believe heliocentrism until Galileo observed the moons of Jupiter. More specifically, he observed this, the moons orbiting Jupiter itself. That was absolutely undeniable proof that there were bodies orbiting things that weren't Earth. We kept believing in geocentrism until we broke it beyond deniability. Now, every observation, every space mission, every piece of data ever collected by man supports this model of the solar system. We're extremely unlikely to find evidence to d that disproves the fact that the Earth orbits the Sun. That the Earth orbits the Sun is a fact, but it is also a hypothesis. We accept it as a fact and base our calculations and lives on it, but there's always a chance, however small, that we are wrong, that we are not orbiting the Sun. And ultimately, the foundation of the scientific method is holding both to be true at once, simultaneously basing our calculations on it, but being completely open to being wrong. Now, that's a very counterintuitive, counterintuitive mental state. It's almost double-think, holding two opposite things to be true at once. Except this is absolutely important, absolutely vital. If we can't hold electromagnetic theory to be true, while still open to it being wrong, we couldn't have invented sensors and computers and transistors and electron colliders that would eventually disprove that theory. It has to be both true and false at once. Second thing about the scientific method, non-disprovables. Science in general says we can prove things, not disprove things. Let's take two examples. We can all agree that Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny are falsehoods. They do not exist. Any rational adult would agree. But question, can you disprove the existence of either of these two stories? Sure, you can prove to me that they exist. You, you can find Santa Claus, capture him, study his reindeer, find his lair in the North Pole. You can prove all of these things. But can you prove to me that he is merely the figment of a child's imagination? No, you cannot. It's non-disprovable. You simply don't find any evidence that supports his existence. So instead, we have to look at all the available evidence and use Occam's razor. What's the most likely and simple and logical explanation to that fits the observations that we're making? What's more likely that a man living in the ice caps uh, has reindeer that defy the laws of physics and carries enough presence on his small sleigh that would normally occupy the volume of a large mountain, or that in the history of societal tradition, parents create the idea and the story of such a man and put presents under the tree for their child? What's more believable and what's more likely that a human-sized and sentient rabbit exists, or that this is, again, a story. These things are, by the scientific method, fundamentally non-disprovable. Now, this brings me back to autism. Fact, vaccines don't cause autism. But we, when we ask the scientists about this, what do they say? They say, no link has been shown. They don't say vaccines don't cause autism. They say no link has been shown because that's how the scientific method works. Now, you can prove vaccines cause autism, right? You can have two groups of babies with large sample sizes. You have a, a test group and a control group. With a control group, you don't give them vaccines, and with a test group, you do give them vaccines. And then you follow these babies along their lives, and you see if one group is more or less likely to develop signs of autism. If you see a disproportionate uh, development of autism in the test group, you have proven vaccines cause autism. But how do you prove vaccines don't cause autism? You can't. You simply find no difference in the expression of autism in the test and control group. You simply show that there is no link. Proving that vaccines don't cause autism is just as impossible as proving that Santa Claus doesn't exist. Both fundamentally impossible. Let's change topics. The science is, is not settled on this. I mean, and, I, and I tell somebody, I said, just because you have a group of scientists that have stood up and said, here is the fact. My, my view is that we don't know what's causing climate change on this planet. And the idea of spending trillions and trillions of dollars to try and reduce CO2 emissions is not the right course for us. 4% of U.S. Senate Republicans 
publicly question the science of global warming. The age of the dinosaurs was dramatically warmer than this is right now, and it didn't cook the planet. And in fact, life was fine. Uh, Are you convinced that climate change is man-made? Well, I, uh, look, I, I don't know that that is a resolved issue in science today. So what I'm hearing from this video is that we need to be certain about something before we act. But don't you see how this conflicts? We've just agreed that you can never be sure about anything. If the bar for action is this impossible standard, we never take action. We drown before we put on a life jacket. So what's the right way to decide whether or not to act? So it's actually an expected value equation shown here. It's the chance of something, something happening multiplied by the goodness of that happening minus the chance of some other event happening multiplied by the badness of that event happening. Applied to autism, X is vaccines functioning properly, Y is vaccines functioning improperly and causing autism. So putting some numbers to this, let's say there's a 1% chance that vaccines cause autism. It's not, but let's just say there is. So you have a 99% chance of good things happening. And in this case, like on a scale of 1 to 100, let's say you're saving millions of lives worldwide per year. Let's say that's a 80 on a scale of 1 to 100. Now, on the 1% chance that you, your kid does get autism, you know, that's really bad because it's your kid, even worse than millions of other kids dying, so let's put that at 100. So even in that case, it's a 78.2, right? And if it's greater than 50, we should act. So here's the thing, though. We don't think about decisions this way. When we think about decisions, we ask ourselves questions. And we generally ask ourselves this question, what happens if I do something? I hope to leave you today with these three tools. Because at the end of the day, the scientific method and these three ideas are what separates man from ape. It's what has allowed us in the past to get here, to invent, to progress, and to thrive. If we want a positive future, these three ideas are not optional. They are necessary. Let's hope we remember how we got here before it is too late. Thank you very much.